Collaboration Awards. Here is one of your hosts, representing the League of Professional Theater Women, where she is Vice President of Programming, and our co-president, Shellen Lubin. Thank you so much. And I would like to introduce my new co-president, who is also our fabulous announcer, representing, every year she's our fabulous announcer, <laughs> representing sag After, where she is national co-chair of the Women's Committee, Leslie Shreve. And we have one more host, the woman who until very recently was co-president of the coalition with Shellen, and still is my wonderful SAG after local women's committee chair, Avis Boone. We're so glad that you guys are here tonight. <laughs> and you may not know this, but most of you are members of Women in the Arts and Media Coalition. If you're a member of any of the unions, guilds, and organizations who are members of the coalition, you are a member. They pay the dues, you get the benefits. That includes, and please raise your hand if you're a member, Actors' Equity Association. Yeah. Woo, we got a big turnout of them tonight. Us tonight. Associated Musicians of Greater New York, Local 802 AFM, one of our newest members. The Dramatists Guild. <laughs> the League of Professional Theater Women. Yes. Wait, wait, there's many more. <laughs> New York Women in Communications. Yay. New York Women in Film and Television. Yay. SAG AFTRA. <laughs> the Society of Stage Directors and Choreographers. And Writers Guild of America East. And our affiliate, our, right. Applause. And our affiliate member organizations, Women in Music, Women Arts, oh, we have a lot of people here tonight, Women Make Movies, Women's Media Center, Works by Women, Dancers Over 40, no one wants to say, Drama Desk, International Center for Women Playwrights. Woo! Yes. LA Film Playwrights Initiative. Fe LA I'm sorry, LA Female Playwright Initiatives. The Lambs. Yes. National Theater Conference. Hello. Professional Women Singers Association. There you go. The Rehearsal Club. And 365 Women a Year. So, you may notice we have many more member orgs than last time, yes? We are adding more all the time. It is very exciting. For over 20 years, the Women in the Arts and Media Coalition has fostered its own brand of collaboration, combining our member organization's abilities and strengths, focusing on issues of concern to women in the arts and media. <laughs> And we are committed to being the link between our member organizations as we collaborate to empower women in our industry through advocacy, mentoring, networking, and events. And we have two signature events. One is this one, the Collaboration Awards, celebrating women working with women. And the other is Vintage, celebrating the work and image of older women, which, I know, <laughs> which should be happening at this time next year, October 2016. We also collaborate with all of our member organizations to co-produce events like Swan Day, which is Support Women Artists Now Day. The last Sunday in March, usually held right here in this theater, partnering, partnering with SBA and NYWIFT. Our first, SBA is our first academic affiliate, and we are so grateful to SBA for hosting us today. Thank you, Reeves Lehman, who's off winning an award for a film he's in. Thank you also, Jess Jackson, Baija Alexandra, and the whole staff here. You've been fabulous. Absolutely. They are fabulous. Yeah. From ageism to gender bias to working in new media, the coalition networks and connects individuals and entire organizations to share information, 
to sponsor events, and to facilitate actions that nurture the voices and visions of women. <laughs> the coalition has grown so much in the last few years, especially online. Don't know if you've been to our website recently, but our website is one of the most important things we now offer you. On our website, you'll find our, find our blog and communal calendar full of events and info from all of our organizations and more, including events that are live streamed online and can be seen by anyone, anywhere, like this one, which is right now on HowlRound TV. Thank you so much, Thank HowlRound, so much. for live streaming this tonight. And you'll also find our stage ops and screen ops newsletters full of submission opportunities in theater and film and video pr produced with the support of Women Arts and the League of Professional Theater Women. And our newest page links to gender parity studies across the country and around the world. Studies of women's representation in theater, film, and television, curated by the LA Female Playwrights Initiative. We have many thank yous in the program, so please read them. But we want to acknowledge especially the wonderful women who run our organization. So with the current board of organization representatives of the coalition, please stand up and be acknowledged. We love you all. Acknowledging the foundation of, uh, upon which we have grown, we'd like to recognize our past presidents, like me. Will you please stand up? The collaboration award process began almost a year ago with a dynamic team of women whose commitment and passion remained steadfast for an entire year. Our mission? to encourage and reward women who work collaboratively with women of other disciplines to create a new media art or, or media project. The reading committee carefully read and analyzed each submission over three rounds. And the last round was particularly difficult. There were so many quality submissions this year. Tonight, we not only celebrate the winning project and all the finalists, but also all the collaborations that will continue to be done by for and through the staunch support of the Women of Media and Arts Coalition. And now, we would like to introduce our keynote speakers. Two women who are models of collaboration themselves and fierce advocates for the voice and vision of women in the arts and media. Denise Alpert and Melissa Musson Gerstein are co-creators of a multi-platform lifestyle brand featured on TV, online, in print, in taxi cabs, and on radio nationwide. They are host of the XM, uh, the Sirius XM Stars program, The Moms with the Denise and Melissa. They also contribute to PIX 11 Morning News every Monday. Albert and Gerstein have turned motherhood into a platform that reaches millions of parents each year. They created a town hall event series that they moderate <laughs> called Mama Razzi where they provide influential moms in media with access to celebrities to discuss issues. Recent Mamarazzi events have included celebrity guests Nicole Kidman, Salma Hayek, Jada Pinkett Smith, and Tina Fey. They regularly partner with film distributors, book publishers, and celebrity publicists to present engaging and informative conversations. Denise Albert and Melissa Gerstein. The Moms! heels for sure. <laughs> what a nice introduction. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. We are truly honored. I'm Melissa. Wait, by the way, after all this time, how do you know this is your slide? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> you might get that. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> right? How many years? Hello again. Um, this is really an honor. I, um, I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri, and I moved to New York because I was a dancer, and I had big dreams of Broadway, but I ended up working for um, Broadway producers Fran and Barry Weisler, who some of you may know, some of you may be nodding and asking me if I'm okay. Yes, I'm okay. Um, and it was a wonderful experience, but that led me into film and to television, and then I met this one, Denise, and you can take it away from there. 
Um, and my background is I am from New York. You probably can guess that as well. Um, <laughs> um, my career was really in television um, and journalism, and I started working in television when I was 14 and wound up as a senior producer at Good Morning America. Um, and that's where I met Melissa um, in early 2000s, I guess. And Melissa was working at CNBC and CNN. And we both um, were starting to have families and wanted to start a business that was really in line with everything that we'd worked so hard doing, which was television and journalism and telling people's stories. And so we decided to start a company based on what we knew and loved, but in a space that we could sort of create and work around our schedules. And so we started the company, it was originally called Moms in the City, and we started as a column in a newspaper. Much like Sex in the City, we were writing a first person column based on anything that was going on in our lives, and we tried to be bold and interesting, and we interviewed a celebrity based on what we were talking about. Um, and from there, we really thought, hey, we're writing this newspaper column, we should let people know what we're doing. So we just started a very casual email blast to let our friends and family and, and contacts know what we were doing. And from there, we started booking ourselves on television shows, and then we got into our own show. Um, so we had a show for two years with NBC. Uh, they had a cable station called NBC Nonstop, and we had a couple different segments on the show, and one was called Mamarazzi, which was our celebrity interview about parenting. And we decided that the best place at the time in New York was to be in taxi cabs. And so we did our own little um, deal with the taxi folks. And so that's sort of how I think we really started to um, build our company. And then we, um, the, sh the channel was launching Los Angeles. And we said, hey, you know what? Nobody's going to promote the show we the way we can. So we flew to LA. We got a brand on board to pay for the party. And we invited a few celebrities to come cover the event. And that was the first time that we said, hey, you know what? We can throw a party and get a little press out of it and make a little money. We might have something here. So, um, and she's speaking about our Mamarazzi events. And, and some of you have attended, you just recently attended our suffragette Mamarazzi event with the writer, Abby Morgan and Sarah, I'm saying her name, I can't, what, do you remember her last name, Sarah? Anyways, and, and so what we do is we aggregate moms and women and bloggers to come and have a conversation around the topic of the film. Sometimes we do Broadway show Mamarazzi events and we bring the cast up after and we talk about parenting and how it is today and being a working mom and a working woman and, and what's really exciting is that everyone sort of lets down their guard and it's a really engaging conversation. And so our Mamarazzi events, we've done over a hundred of them. We would love to have you attend. Um, and we sometimes have celebrities such as Hugh Jackman, Sarah Jessica Parker, Hugh Jackman, Hugh Jackman. <laughs> and, um, and, and we record the Mamarazzi event for our SiriusXM show to engage other moms who can call in, and, or dads, or women, anyone, to engage in the conversation around parenting and around um, the celebrity and whatever they're promoting. But what's really nice is, you know, they let down their guard and they really talk about their children, which is you know, the most important thing to them. And so you, it's, it's fresh editorial content that you're not hearing anywhere else. Is that right? That's right. Okay. But um, I think for us, um, what we found in our town hall events, in our television appearances, in our Sirius XM radio show, is what we try to do is bring in other women from around the country um, and share their stories, um, bring them on to talk with us about what topics they're writing about or they're talking about in their circles. Um, it's really about bringing the conversation together and including as many different kinds of people as possible. Because we really, empowering, it is, it's very empowering and we feel like, um, it, it's really just like any group of friends just chatting. And we always said we're so different um, in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, and so really just even in our, our parenting skills and Melissa's happily married with three children, I'm happily divorced with two, um, we do everything really differently. She thinks I'm loosey-goosey, she's, totally. she's not anymore for breakfast. breakfast, but it's okay. Um, but everything, you know, we always felt like we could really learn from each other and you might like something that I have to say, you might hate something I have to say, but the next thing that comes out of my mouth, you might say, oh, I can relate to that. And so that's what we try to do in all of our conversations and that's what we try to do on our radio show, um, is really engage other, not just moms, dads too, in the conversation. And when we go on Pix 11, we, we also bring other moms in the tri-state area on with us who might be 
trying to raise awareness to something that they're doing. So we really do like to share everyone's stories. Yes. How'd that go? That's great. You did a really good job. So again, it's such an honor for us to be here. We hope to support all of you. We would love to invite you on our Serious XM show and talk about your organizations and support you however we can. But thank you so much. Oh, we're not done yet. No, um, because this is all about collaboration, so I think it's important to know about the collaboration that we have. That's nice. We, um, we call ourselves Work Wives. Um, because Hold on, I just have to have a minute. Like, I grew up watching LA Law. I'm sorry. I mean, I would race home from school school and I remember my mom would tape it and I'd eat Fruity Pebbles which is probably the worst thing you could eat and it's just so wonderful. But I get my two kids to talk for breakfast so and you're eating great. Fruity Pebbles. You know how they're bringing back all the shows now? Let's bring it back. Can we? Let's start like a movement. No, you don't like it? You're tired? Yeah, you're not sure. Oh, he's on to the next You'd rather do commercials, more residuals, right? I don't there know. Um, where was I? Work wives. Yes, collaboration. Um, so we hated each other when we met. Um, strong word. We didn't. I hate Two strong women. I did not like her. Sorry, you didn't like me either. You're pretending now? I like okay. Hard to say that. Right. But okay. we, I, we did not like each other. Um, I don't know why we gave it another chance. Um, but we did. I think, I think we both were drawn to each other because we found, this is so fun. <laughs> we found, um, we did find, you know, when you, somebody that, you know works really hard and I think that was what brought us back together um, after the initial meeting that we were like oh she's a bitch or she thinks she's always right or, but that's what it was and so um, it did it took some time and we realized that we met our match because we met somebody who wanted it just as badly who who was going to work just as hard and it's been we, we took it in baby steps. I mean, we started as a common newspaper in 2009. The company, as it currently exists, is really since 2012. Um, so it's taken a long time, um, but there's this incredible respect. We are best friends, we are sisters, we are wives, we are husbands, we are, our kids are family. So it, 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 it's beautiful, it's amazing. So it took time, but... Um, it works, and we don't. Need I think to the underlining theme is when you meet other women who work just as hard. It's contagious, right? And that's why we're all here tonight. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna wrap it up now, guys. Okay. No, but before we do, because we do, we built our brand on social media. We do need to take a selfie and a regular picture. So well, this is how this is what we do. So we'll take one like this, and then we'll give it to somebody else to do for us. Yeah, really. And then if, who's in the front row? Michael. This is what we do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. We're really honored. Very, very honored. Thank you. Mama Rati. Aren't they fun? Thank you so much, guys. And their events are that much fun, too. Though I will say we all cried through Suffragette, but the event was great fun. And you should definitely get on their mailing list. Yeah. Oh, sorry, momsatthemoms.com. Really hard to remember. Momsatthemoms.com. Okay, the two women who really made tonight happen, and it took a long time, it took a year to do it, the co-chairs of the Collaboration Awards Committee are another example of outstanding collaboration. I want to ask the two of you to come out here now. Please give them a big hand. Representing the Dramatist Guild, Holly Harms. She's the one. And representing Actors Equity Association, Brenda Gardner. And you two can now get ready to hand out all the awards and certificates. And now, our award presenters. Casey McLean has worked as technical director for Dixon Place and is the production coordinator and resident lighting designer for Concrete Temple Theater, where she has worked off-Broadway and toured internationally, get this, to India, Sri Lanka, Turkey, Italy, and Bulgaria. Casey currently works as operations manager for Samuel French. Amy Rose Marsh began working for Samuel, Samuel French as a literary intern and was quickly promoted to associate editor. 
During her time as editor, she was responsible for bringing more than 400 new acting additions into print, including new works by Sarah Rule and Teresa Rebick. She is currently the literary director of Samuel French, where she oversees licensing and acquisitions. Together, they are co-artistic directors of the Samuel French Off-Off Broadway Short Play Festival, currently celebrating its 40th anniversary, though they haven't been doing it for 40 years. <laughs> to present the 2015 Collaboration Award, Casey McLean and Amy Rose Marsh. Short Play Festival, um, Amy and I are so honored and humbled to be asked to be presenters tonight. This is truly an honor, and we want to thank Women in the Arts and Media Coalition for inviting us. Um, so the Samuel French Festival, the Off Off Broadway Short Play Festival, is the longest, it's the oldest running, most continuous short play festival, um, I think, in the world. So we haven't we haven't quite figured that out, but I know we're. Um, no one can really compete with us. And we've been, for the past 40 years, a wonderful playground um, for playwrights to test out and explore new works, often um, with collaborators. So the festival, Casey can explain a little bit more about how it works. Um, it's actually a really fascinating festival. Um, it's a little like American Idol, but we've been doing it for 40 years, so we're definitely had the idea first. Um, so we open up submissions um, sometime between December and March, and we collect as many short play festival, or short plays as possible. They have to be 30 minutes or less. Um, last year we got 1,500 submissions, our biggest to date, um, and we're always looking for more. Um, so from those 1,500, um, a slew of volunteers in the office at, in New York, in London, and in, and in LA read through all of the material. Um, we all grade it, we rate it, um, somehow we get it down to 30. We go from 1,500 down to 30. It takes about five months. And so once we have those 30, then we get to send out amazing emails that tell these playwrights that they've made it into the festival. And so we invite everybody um, to New York, um, if they're in New York or not in New York, um, to participate in our festival. It's actually, the festival is uh, a week long, so we'll do all 30 plays in four days. And it's usually the end of July, early August. Um, so in those four days, in the first round of the festival, everybody goes once. Um, there's seven to eight plays each night. Uh, we invite celebrity judges in our, in our caliber, um, playwrights, <laughs> artistic directors, <laughs> to come in, and they will judge that evening's um, performances. And then they'll choose their favorite one to three. Um, we then have uh, those four nights, we usually hit around, have 10 to 12 that make it on to the finals, and we go on Saturday, we'll do 10 to 12, ooh, all in a row, um, and then from there, the staff chooses six to publish and license in a collection. And it's a very big deal. We've had a lot of great playwrights launch their career at the OOB Festival, um, and a lot of great female playwrights specifically launch their career. We've always been kind of an alternative festival. We pride ourselves on being off, off, off Broadway, and I think because of that, and because of the spirit of experimentation, and because we're reading pools of submissions, um, we've been incredibly successful at achieving gender parity um, for at least the past 10 years, both in terms of our submission pool and also in terms of our winners. Um, in fact, I think this year, Casey, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we had more women than men. Um, yeah, so that, that was actually a first time for us. And <laughs> so more female playwrights, they beat, beat the male playwrights, which was kind of fun, fun for us. But there is no bias, we judge, yeah. <laughs> so. and and it really is a collaboration. Um, we ask the playwright to bring a producer. Um, we do bare bones, just above a stage reading. We give them black cubes and, and basic lighting. So it really is about the raw script. So. 
Yeah, but it's it's a unique format. I mean, this playwright and their director and their production company, I mean, they really have to trust each other and work to build something that can kind of work in this crazy festival space we've created. Um, and, you know, I like to say, I mean, the plays are the winners. They're going to be published and licensed around the world. And it's beautiful. I mean, we've had productions of festival work in, in places like Dubai and then, you know, a little high school in Kentucky. So it's a very sweet end result. But really, the winners of the festival are often the collaborations, these great relationships that come out of working together um, between the director and the playwright, but also between us and the playwright and us and the director. So it's a really beautiful thing. And we're very happy to be here tonight celebrating that with you all. Um, and with that, now on to our 2015 Collaboration Award-winning project, Queens for a Year. This play is about four generations of women in the military. It was developed and researched and dramaturged on both parts by the playwright and the director, and also by Elizabeth Williamson, the Associate Artistic Director of Hartford Stage. Over the course of the development, um, it was workshopped up at Hartford Stage. Um, the playwright knew the audience needed to experience the depth of conflict, um, and she needed um, some collaboration to help clear up the issues that were raised by this play. So she um, sought out a director who understood the conflict and knew how to guide a multi-generational ensemble of women to dramatize military women's history visually, verbally, verbally I can't even say, verbally and orally. <laughs> The play speaks to a number of important issues for women. Does a woman have to sacrifice what is female and assume a male attitude to succeed in a male-dominated warrior culture? Is there any good place for women trained in combat, in violence, in war, within our society? At what price do we put women into a subculture whose language denigrates anything female? What is the vicarious thrill or revolution we get from the idea of women trained to kill? What about women's unsung role as the cleanup crew for men harmed in war? Is it moral to put women in a, into a career where the greatest danger is from her fellow male coworkers rather than the enemy? All of these questions and more are explored in the rich, textured, fully realized work and for it, the Women in the Arts and Media Coalition Awards, the 2015 Collaboration Award to Queens for a Year, and to its playwright, T.D. Mitchell. And director, Cheryl Caller. <laughs> Accepting the award for Ms. Caller, who lives in Boston with a show that is in previews at the Huntington Theater, is her daughter, Toby Zareski. I'm here to accept this honor for my mom, Cheryl Caller. As they said, she's in Boston right now working with another female playwright. Uh, so I'm going to read her speech. T.D. Mitchell has given a voice to a community of women that needs to be heard and poses a plethora of questions about what it means to be a woman in the military and at what sacrifice. As importantly, she has illuminated this magnificent multi-generational female family and their bond with such grace, humility, emotion, honor, intelligence, power, and integrity. TD shows up every single day setting the bar for being the best you can be. She's incredibly kind and caring, but never mistake her kindness for weakness. She is a strong, brilliant woman who can listen with as much strength as she can speak. This has and continues to be one of the most enriching collaborations of my mom's career. She is beyond disappointed that she can't be here, yet she feels like it is beyond appropriate to me to have her here. Uh, to have me here in her place, sorry. She strives to set an example for me and my sister Tess and to be an amazing woman in an amazing room with amazing women. She feels it's her obligation to celebrate and support and give opportunity to all the females within her community. She's honored and humbled to be celebrated by all of you and thanks you and TD from the bottom of her heart, thanks. And now playwright TD Mitchell. It is a privilege to be in the company of such talented, creatively innovative women as are represented by the work of each finalist here tonight. 
Some of your work I know, and all of your projects I wish to know better, and I sincerely applaud all of you. Let's please do our next dozen projects together. <laughs> and um, as Cheryl asked Toby to accept for her tonight, I have my very first supporter and collaborator as my guest, my mom, Dolores, because this whole multi-generational stories of women thing Cheryl and I have got going is not limited to Queens for a year. So, con collaboration. Unlike in television, playwriting is not writing by committee, a challenging endeavor in its own right, but utterly unlike what I do as a playwright. There are typically months and usually years of research and interviews before bits of story begin to irritate the inside of my skull behind my forehead right here, leading to a, a physiological discomfort I've learned as my signal that it's time to write. And those bits of scenes, those flashes of moments between characters never reveal themselves in a linear form for me. When I finally start putting words on paper, I have no idea how the play begins, nor how it ends, no matter how I might pummel and wrestle my imagination. My damned muse refuses to be linear. I envy writers who can throw text on the blank page through sessions of devised theater co-working, or at least in conversation with a partner director, a la Lanford Wilson and Marshall Mason, a partner performer, or collaborative company of performative artists such as Pina Bausch's Dance Theater Wuppertal or Steppenwolf. The sort of incestuous, dysfunctional family creative disorganization organization with the luxury of organic time is a home to be devoutly wished for, even for someone like me who functions best with a minimum of five hours of solitude each day, and I mean waking hours. And when the brilliant dramaturg and associate artistic director at Hartford Stage, Elizabeth Williamson, asked me if there was a director I especially wanted to work with for last spring's development workshop, I immediately said Cheryl Caller. Now, I didn't yet know if Cheryl and I would prove effective collaborators. At least 90% of the work I do as a writer is bled out in solitude, and another 2% done in the company of female writer friends, some of whom are here tonight, over too much wine as I lament about how I've bitten off more than I could chew and I'm just a big fraud and I can't really write and this happens with every play, it's just not just this one. And they talk me down and pick me up and well that's, that's collaborative in its way. With the radical restructuring Elizabeth and Darko were encouraging me to go ahead and try with Queens at Hartford, I was eager to see how well Cheryl and I worked together in the high stakes, high pressure, all too brief but densely valuable workshop environment. A few years ago, Cheryl was slipped what was the first draft of this play and asked that we meet. I liked her immediately. Bold, passionate, warm, strong, feminist, a little intimidating, and unapologetic about being all of those. She is known for directing premieres of new work and understands the profound vulnerability of both play and playwright as the script takes its first shaky steps into the world. Our tiny folds, legs wobbly and trembling in rehearsal, far from ready to run in the big race. But the primary reason I wanted Cheryl as my collaborator with Elizabeth Williamson, we were much more of a triumvirate of women than a duo is that Cheryl isn't the 26-year-old fresh out of Yale School of Drama and the Lincoln Center Lab Flavor of the Month Enfant Terrible Arthur. She's a grown woman. She's a mother of two adult daughters for whom she paused her career at great cost to raise. And so yes, she's of a certain age, which for women in Hollywood or Broadway or too many industries means she's over 40 or over 45 even or dead. <laughs> um, thankfully, Cheryl's very much alive and well, even if she is cheating on me with another playwright in Boston right now. But it's a woman, so that, that's, a, that's better. <laughs> to me, no one else could be more qualified to understand and help translate into performance a story about four generations of women, of women with a history of doing men's work and to provide the checks and balances for a younger writer writing older characters like me than Cheryl. Not that I'm fresh out of grad school either. 
As it turned out, we three, Cheryl, Elizabeth, and I collaborated beautifully together, and the key to that success was for us, I believe, to ask vigorous questions constantly of script structure, of moments in story, of language, and of silences, and specifically by Cheryl, questions of our brave cast of eight women and, for a change, one token man. And it was through that vigorous questioning that I was able to hear where I might shore up the weak points, tighten or extend an emotional arc, create specificity where there had been too much ambiguity, and to keep certain ambiguities opaque by active choice rather than by writer's oversight. Cheryl protects without coddling, and for me to be in the rehearsal room observing her challenging assumptions actors had made about a character or moment or intention in the script was itself a collaborative process between us, even when I was just silently observing her. Now don't get me wrong, we, we did not always agree, but we consistently pushed each other to take risks and do better. Questions. I am never out to give an audience the answers in my plays. I endeavor instead to confront them with what I hope are difficult questions. Cheryl and Elizabeth understood that goal and fully embraced it as their own. We questioned, we, questioned, we spoke, poked at the sore spots and we questioned again, and I cried in frustration and sleep deprivation, and sometimes my answer was, I don't know, I pass. Ask me in two hours. Can I not just drink this non-fat chai latte in peace? <laughs> Collaboration is not and cannot be a passive exercise, nor can the mentorship and professional support of women by other women. We as female artists cannot afford to waste time being anything less than adamant and vigorous and, if necessary, downright militant about working together, challenging each other in a healthy way and pushing each other up and forward. This responsibility is not limited to artists. Two recent studies show female scientists to be less likely to cite the publications authored by other female scientists than male scientists do of their male peers. In another study, female academics who are full professors are many times less likely to co-author papers with junior female academics than they are with junior male faculty. And as we in the theater have seen proved too often, female artistic directors of major theaters are just as likely to neglect to program more than one token play by a woman in their season and to hire no more than one single female director in their season. Women are perpetuating our own inequity, falling down on our responsibility failing to raise each other's voices, failing to help achieve that parity we say we deserve. I had the incredible honor of meeting and spending an afternoon with a fierce 98-year-old veteran, Don Seymour, back in July. Don was a WASP during World War II, a woman air service pilot. The WASP and WAFs transported and tested military aircraft for the Army. In their oversized jumpsuits and underfunded program, they trained baby-faced male cadets how to instrument fly, stall, dive, land, bomb with, strafe from, and troubleshoot each and every aircraft used by the U.S. during the war. Dawn became known for her expertise piloting B-17s, the four-engine flying fortresses. We got to talking, and she asked about my writing. She was excited by my work that I was writing about women's unsung role historically in the U.S. military. And she wanted to know how she could see it or read it and follow my progress. And I told her, sure, I had a website and I write under T.D. Mitchell, to which she responded, I don't understand. Why the initials? Why don't you write as Trista? So I explained to her that it was to my professional advantage when people who didn't know me read my scripts that they presume I am a man. Because my work is described as muscular. Because my first breakout play was for seven men over 60 and a 20-something Vietnamese dude. Again, Jill, I can barely apologize. <laughs> but mostly because, depending on which study you read, 
men are 80 to 85 percent more likely to be given productions in the English-speaking commercial theater than are females. Dawn grabbed my hands in hers, a flash of anger in her eyes, shook her head, and in that moment she saw me as her sister, her comrade, in the same damn war. Well, isn't that just how it is for us? <laughs> a shame. The information and entrepreneurial pioneer Dame Stephanie Shirley made her fortune in the programming and system software world by founding the first tech company staffed solely by women in the early 1960s, and in the process pioneered the idea of flex time and working out of the home for the code writers who were, who were also moms. Much of the business conducted with her clients and investors during that era was via snail mail, which was advantageous for Stephanie Shirley because at the suggestion of her husband, when her business funding proposal letters were getting no response, she adopted the nickname Steve and began signing her correspondence, Steve Shirley. And suddenly, there were interested funders, and they were writing back. And though it was not a malicious dissemblance, there was no denying that in securing new business, their assumption that Steve, the CEO, was a man, coupled with their complete ignorance of the fact that Steve's entire workforce of data analysts, mathematicians, tech engineers, and programmers were women, was what made it possible in the 1960s to build and grow her company, Freelance Programmers, a company valued at over $3 billion, ultimately making 70 of her employees millionaires, because she also helped pioneer the employee as percentage owner compensation structure. So finally, the male business culture could dismiss this powerhouse no more. Dame Steve is fond of saying, you can always tell ambitious women by the shape of our heads. They're flat on top from being patted patronizingly. <laughs> oh, well done, you. Well done. I look around this room and I see quite a few flattened heads. And I wish that women collaborating with other women was de rigueur rather than something extraordinary requiring an award such as this one. I think about meeting Dawn Seymour and though I am deeply flattered by being thought of a sister to a woman I regard as a heroine, I am embarrassed that at 98 we have not done better by her through greater advancement in the status of women in our varied professions. For women to continue to regard each other as competitors and adversaries is counterproductive and ultimately self-defeating. There is no time to waste, no time for passivity or polite acquiescence. The time for this work together, this vigorous collaboration, is not just now. It was 70 years ago. So please, let's get on with the work. Just come join us. Wow, that was fabulous. Thank you. Now you see what a great writer she is, and you must all go read and see her work. I wish you could have been there the night we debated these awards. I mean, first of all, it was so much fun. Uh, but also, these next three projects that you're going to hear about had such an equivalent amount of support and admiration from the reading team that instead of doing what we usually do, which is tearing them, we decided to just have three equal honored finalist teams. The quality of the work that is submitted to us is one of the great joys of having the Collaboration Award. The other is hearing from these women how they work together. So we want to give each pair of collaborators of just a few minutes to tell you a little about a little bit about their collaborative process. 
The first one is Yellow Card, Red Card, which is based on the real life stories of the girls in Breaking Ground Football, a girls' soccer program in Nagaundere, Cameroon, which is predominantly Muslim. It was a shot in the dark getting families to let girls out of the home to join the team and not knowing what the long-term effects might be of the program. The piece's structure mirrors that of a soccer match. On the field, the girls perform the physical work of drills and exercises while they test the limits of their abilities and their expectations. At home, the girls perform the housework of preparing meals while under the unilateral authority of their husbands and fathers. The scenes that occur on the field are comprised of athletic movement that occurs simultaneously with the dialogue. By the end of the play, the scenes move fluidly between on and off the field, and for a few minutes, it seems the girls on and off field selves have coalesced as much as they possibly can. For honored finalist, yellow card, red card, director Tamala Woodard, who is in Cuba tonight with TCG, so can't be here, and playwright Melissa Tien. Thank you so much. Thank you, ladies. It's such an honor to be among the theater makers who are being acknowledged tonight. There are many others, of course, doing fierce and beautiful work, maybe some of you or people you know. And I want to take a moment and say how important it is to have your support so that women in theater can continue against powerful odds to do the work that they do. Not only is it important to encourage women to keep making theater, it's necessary to encourage them to make it together. There's no better or quicker way to achieve parity by 2020. When I started work on Yellow Card, Red Card, I knew that the only way to tell the truth of what these girls are living was to go to Cameroon, bring back what I had seen, and work with women to bring to life this story of women achieving their own agency. When I began thinking about bringing on board a director, I made a wish list I asked a trusted colleague for her recommendations and was happy to see that Tamala Woodard was at the top of both of our lists. I had not yet met Tamala, but I had seen her work and I'd heard good things. And while I thought of how I'd approach her with the project, I'd gone to a reading and lo and behold, she was in the audience. Before the reading began, in a now or never moment, I tapped her on the shoulder and introduced myself and told her I had a play I thought she might be interested in. We talked more during intermission, made plans to meet, and after that meeting have been joined at the hip for this project ever since. And I can't pinpoint exactly what makes her a great collaborator for this particular play. Though in general, a good collaborator will share your vision, be communicative, and be a good listener. Tamala does all these things, but there is something more. She loves the play, that's clear but she also brings to it a serendipitous blend of experience, <coughs> intelligence, creativity, and thoughtfulness that makes the play a bloom a little more each time we work on it. And she brings all of herself to it. There is nothing more I could ask from a creative partner. Right now, as we've learned, Tamina, Tamala is in Cuba with a cohort of artists who receive special permission to be there, observe, and take notes. Besides being incredibly jealous, <laughs> I am incredibly proud to call her my collaborator. Thank you. South Street Annie is inspired by the life of Gloria Wasserman, the profane mother of the Fulton Fish Market, and later East 4th Street. She spent decades selling newspapers, cigarettes, and herself to the fishmongers on South Street until the fish market moved to the Bronx. Then she took up residence on the steps of KGB Bar and became a storytelling, dirty joke telling fixture until her death in 2010. At the same time she lived as Annie on the streets, however, she raised a family and was putting her granddaughter through college. Set in and around the Fulton Fish Market's final days downtown, South Street Annie is a time-spinning tale of fish, loss, sex, architecture, and the ghosts of New York City with music. <laughs> 
<laughs> For honored finalist South Street Annie, playwright Carson Kreitzer, who can't be with us tonight, so she'll be represented by Carol Lynn Baumler and director Elise S. Singer. Come on up, ladies. Thank you all so much. And congratulations to the other finalists and winners. Um, first, I want to say that in honoring this playwright director collaboration, the coalition is also honoring a third collaborator, actor Carolyn Baumler. Um, for more than two decades, uh, I have worked with Carolyn on original plays, many of which were created specifically for her. Um, and South Street Annie was initially conceived with her in mind. Um, Carson and I have known each other since the 80s and had never worked together. And Carolyn had worked with Carson a number of times. And Carolyn and I have worked together, founded a company. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this project is born of that three-way collaboration. Um, and we also had envisioned the extraordinary Lynn Cohen, who is with us here today, um, for the project from the outset and have been just honored to be working with her as another collaborator, as a central collaborator on the piece for the past year. Yeah. And the second thing I wanted to say was that South Street Annie is still very much a work in progress. And I feel that my collaboration with Carson is still a work in progress. Um, during the uh, New George's Audrey residency that we were fortunate to receive this past year, um, our focus was really on the text and the sonic landscape of the piece. But there's still so much to explore uh, of the, the world of the play. Um, as we continue to collaborate, finding the shape and the scope of the piece vocabulary, it's dramaturgy, how to tell Annie's extraordinary story most effectively and most dramatically. So thank you so much. Oh, okay. thank you. <laughs> oh, um, uh, so I'm uh, reading this on behalf of Carson, who couldn't be here tonight. Um, and she says, uh, this collaboration began with the New York Times obituary of a fascinating woman, which I posted to my Facebook wall. Elise commented, maybe this should be our project, something we've been talking about for years. So really, this collaboration began with the desire to collaborate. The process <laughs> has been a joy, working with Elise, writing for Carolyn Baumler, and getting to do it all in an Audrey residency at New George's with a final reading at New York Theatre Workshop. Thrilling and rewarding beyond belief. The piece has been a treasure hunt and a mystery, poring over pictures of the South Street Seaport at various times in its history, finding treasured bits and glimpses of our heroine, uh, putting together a story of immigrant families, of fierceness, of New York, and turning over and over the question raised by Gloria Wasserman's life among ourselves, with actors, and with audience. Her pull is tremendous, elemental. Thanks to all who have given us these opportunities to explore, and thanks to the, woman, the Women in the Arts and Media Coalition for recognizing and supporting these collaborations. Thank you. Thank you. Every Fold Matters is a collaborative, site-specific performance with film and dance about the work of doing laundry. With text developed from interviews with New York City neighborhood laundromat workers, it is performed amidst the washers and dryers of a working laundromat, 
looking at the labor of laundry through a personal and social lens, providing new insight into the way we take care of the things closest to our bodies. Stories about intimacy, clothes, dirt, stains, money, and time are revealed through heightened dialogue and gestural choreographed sequences. This piece also provides an opening into a historic form of domestic work, which is often unseen, tended to, tended to be done by those who go unrecognized and undervalued. While well, honored finalist Every Fold Matters, playwright, director Lizzie Olesker, and filmmaker writer Lynn Sachs. Thank you so, so much for this honor, um, for this fabulous collaboration that I've had with um, filmmaker Lynn Sachs. Uh, I think what we really wanted to talk about today was the nature of starting something new at a point when you're, in your life when you've sort of been on this trajectory for 20 or 30 years. Both, I've been a filmmaker for quite a long time. I call myself an experimental documentary filmmaker. And I felt like I knew my process pretty well. And then there comes a point where you say, well, I don't necessarily want to go learn a new language. I'm not really into knitting. It's not that I just want to travel all over the world because living in New York and with observing things. And the observation could then be translated into an artwork. So um, I'll let Lizzie tell you a little more about how that all got started. Um, this project began, um, I was commissioned to do a piece, a performance piece in a working laundromat through an organization called Loads of Prose. Um, and um, Dirty Laundry Readings, uh, done by Emily Rubin, who in fact was sort of another collaborator with us as a producer. And um, I did a, a, a piece with three performers where we gathered stories about doing laundry. And then I saw something that Lynn was doing, um, a film project called um, your day is my Thank night. You. Your day is my night, where she was looking at um, shift bed apartments in Chinatown, and I just thought her vision was so unique and singular in that it was had this incredible interiority, as well as a social understanding and framing. And I thought how amazing that would be to have film as part of the performance in the laundromat that maybe we could project onto clothes and sheets and that it would really add this whole other thing to what I was doing. Um, but I'll just say that I, um, for me, I've collaborated with a lot of different theater people, but I had never collaborated with another form. So when I heard about this award, it seemed so perfect to me because we really are collaborating not only as two women and two artists, but these two forms came together. Um, and with that in mind, I'll also say, oh, so in working on the piece, um, she really brought this other sensibility to it. And I've had other wonderful collaborations, but what 
her sensibility was as a filmmaker, as an experimental hybrid filmmaker. I was not only engaged in the work, but I was incredibly inspired by her way of working and her vision. Um, and I'll just say that we're continuing. We're not just performing. We've done it in many laundromats, and I'll just say, um, Several of the laundromats we did it in have since closed. Um, it's a disappearing thing in New York City, these neighborhood laundromats. As neighborhoods change, laundromats are disappearing. Um, but we're continuing by just making a film. So we did a theater piece, and now we're going to do a film of the text. I wanted to say one thing about the collaboration. So, so often we know that in the art-making journey, that the biggest obstacles that stand in your way, the things that you think are going to stop you, the, the, the wall that you can't climb, actually on that wall is often some form of graffiti or a mural that tells you how to make that piece. But you just have to figure out where the ladder is. So Lizzie came to me because she wanted to do a, a project around laundry workers and she thought, well, wow, Lynn has a lot of experience talking to people in New York City, um, you know, kicking that in, the, or not pushing in, but tapping on that pr proverbial door that separates you from me and me from you. You know, I've been doing that for a while and I've just done a lot of work in Chinatown. And so she said, let's go talk to laundry workers together. I said, no problem. I issue my own license, we can do that. So we spent a year making appointments with laundry workers and we would get there for our date, you know, for our interview and I would have my tape recorder and every single time they'd say, turn off the tape recorder, my boss won't let me talk to you, my husband won't let me talk to you, I don't have my documentation, I don't want to be on camera, I don't even want to you know, tell you my name. We'd say, okay, let's sit on the bench outside, we won't even ask you what your name is, we just want to talk to you. And then what happens, a filmmaker who had that happen would say, uh-oh, I can't make this film. But a playwright can say, well, we'll just write it. We heard all of this. We'll create, we'll create composites. And so I'll, I'll just, I'll, we'll end. We have to stop. But um, so thank you again. And I just want to say that the play came, and the film come out of that silence and what people were unable to say but that eventually we did speak to them and that it came from that. But again, thank you so much. Thank you. We also want to make note of our four finalist teams, also all worthy projects. As they come up to receive their certificates, we will tell you a little bit about each piece. For Art Takes Soul, are Mindy Gan Mira Gandhi and Aaron Claiborne, are you guys here? Yeah. Oh, good. There they are. <laughs> African American artist Mira Gandhi. Myra. African-American artist Myra Gandhi and Korean-American playwright actor Aram Claiborne created a multimedia art exposition, uh, art exhibition and theater, theatrical performance. Aram portrays eight different characters in her autobiographical story that chronicles her journey from South Africa to the streets of New York. This is merged with a multi... from South Korea from South Korea, wow. <laughs> so from South Korea, I should just start over. From South Korea to the streets of New York. This is merged with a multimedia art show with both theater and visual art components presented at an equal level. Aram's portrayals, portrayals coupled with the collages, videos, and paintings of Myra Gandhi's, both of her own memories and inspired by the play, makes for an interesting and unusual landscape. The pieces bring, brings together the 1980s hip-hop era, immigrant stories, pop culture, vi pop culture visuals, and New York. For 
still will be heard, songwriter performer Liz Queller and director Mindy Cooper. Now, still will be heard is a performance piece marrying contemporary American folk and roots music to the poetry of Edna St. Vincent Millay. The score presents a new take on both the traditional song cycle and the poetry itself. A multi multimedia piece, Still Will Be Heard, explores the power of words lost and found, and the power of art to heal and communicate. Unique in its structure with monologues, songs, letters, and poetry woven together with video images and stage tableaus, bringing deeper meaning to the poetry that serves as a common thread. Unfortunately, our last two finalist teams could not be here with us tonight, but we'd like to tell you a little bit about these projects. I mean, don't they all sound so fascinating? And I also love hearing the stories of how these people work together and how they've found their way through the collaboration. I just think it's all so inspiring. St. Joan is a collaboration between playwright Julia Pascal, who lives in London, which is why she can't be with us, and director Katrin Hilba, who is opening a show right now in Konstanz, Germany. So, St. Joan is about a black Jewish Londoner who dreams she is Joan of Arc and tries to subvert the historical drive towards slavery and Shoah. It takes the concept of the woman warrior and satirizes male power and hegemony. Music, dance, and experimental theater techniques inform the text using imagery to express the subtext. This piece reclaims Joan of Arc from the xenophobic right in France, to whom she is a heroine, and reinvents her as a black Jewish woman who is trying to challenge history and the horror of war. The Loneliest is a collaboration between filmmaker Lillian Merrill and actor Gabriel Schaefer. It is a short film about two women on very different frequencies brought together to find the loneliest whale who sings too high for other whales to hear. This mock behind the scenes of a British nature show is a story about unexpected encounters that turn into moments of connection. This film was shot over three days on a small boat with an entirely female cast and crew on board. Inspired by a true story of the loneliest whale, this film reveals the underlying connection between people, living things, and the environment. Where there is a disregard for other living beings, there is a disconnect that must be bridged. This film inspires empathy for the loneliest among us, whales or people. And please forgive us if we've mispronounced any names. We've gotten to know these people and these pieces so well that, of course, we did it all through reading. So we did not know the proper pronunciation of certain things. These were such unusual works and collaborations this year and very exciting for us and hopefully exciting and inspiring for you as well. Now we are going to say thank you to you for joining us at the awards. To everyone who worked so hard and contributed to making this happen, we are going to note a few of them more in a minute. And to SVA, who has been fabulous, fabulous to us. And we do hope that you will join us in the lobby at our Afterglow party for food and wine and meeting our winners and special guests. But first, <laughs> we would like to take a minute to let you know how important the Women in the Arts and Media Coalition is. We believe that expanding those whose voices are heard and what images are seen can change the world. And we take great pride in the work we do to support that. Our collaboration awards, Vintage, Swan Day, Gender Parity and Theater Initiative, and our new mentorship program in the process of being launched, all support women in a way that isn't being done anywhere else. And we accomplish much more together than we could alone. But we do need funding for our events and for the stage ops and screen ops newsletters and to offer more services to our membership please consider a tax-deductible donation tonight or go to our website anytime and donate. And buy raffle tickets. <laughs> you can always buy raffle tickets. There's still time to buy them. So you, uh, while you're eating and drinking and vibing, enjoying yourselves, you have time. And thank you so much to those fabulous folks who donated the prizes and Holly Harms who pulled it all together. Thank you. Holly. 
thank you to all our guests, including some special guests we'd like to introduce. Elsa Rail down here, who was instrumental in founding this organization, and for whom our Vintage Award is named. Elsa Rail. We also want to spotlight producers Pat Addis, who happens to have raffle tickets around her neck over here. <laughs> and the Bistro Award, Sherry Eaker, both of whom are special advisors to the coalition. Where's hey, Sherry? Sherry? Hey, baby. <laughs> and Becky Curran from the SAG After Diversity Department. Here she yeah. is. Paparazzi to the Mamarazzi, Michael Tucker, thank you for being here. <laughs> and our own Jill Eikenberry. <laughs> and thank you to all our honorees. You prove how much beautiful work and organic change women can generate together. And we hope you had a good time here tonight. We did. And uh, so we, ha we hope each one of you guys did. And uh, if you want to learn more about our member boards and the coalition itself, Hopefully you want to. We, we could accomplish even more if we had the help of each and every one of you here. And yeah, in the, in the lobby there's lots of information available on our info table. Email us or sign up on our website if you're not yet on our mailing list to find out about all of our events and, and projects. And let us know if you'd like to become more involved with the coalition as a volunteer, in person, or online, or maybe even as an organization rep on our board, think about it. Those of you who are not yet on our board, think about it. And being on the mailing list will also ensure that you know when we are accepting submissions for our next collaboration award. We hope to see your project in there. Now, heads up. We are gonna be calling up each of our member organizations to get our group photos in front of the step and repeat out there. So listen for your union or association's name. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And good night. Good night. Good night.